Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, we are back again after our CAD 2 examination. I just now uh, been speaking with you. Mm -hmm. We need to have a, a thing called an adoptive measure of uh, any of the circumstances. So though uh, it is that uh, more rigorous and painful for you, um, you know, from the WhatsApp messages that I have been read, uh, we need to go ahead with our routine. That's what is that uh, it was some just talking uh, just before uh, starting our class. We forgot the recording it. Uh, however, uh, let's go proceed with our uh, uh, regular activity of uh, lecturing. Um, before that, if you have any questions, anything that you want to express or you want to speak it, please, because I do not know what is the uh, other end. We are not in our uh, campus. We are not physically meeting. So always I have to presume that you no, know, uh, my students are eager to listen and then learn. And uh, I, I just have that in my mind and keep forwarding it. Uh, so if you have any of the concern, anything to speak on, you please. And your uh, assessment of CAT 2, please wait uh, till Wednesday. You would know your uh, marks. I am to do uh, so carefully that nobody is going to get affected. Right. Uh, see that how much you are understanding. So I have to take more time to go through everyone's uh, uh, script and this is the uh, thing. So that's why it's been delaying. Uh, however, by Wednesday, I think you would be uh, able to get your uh, valuation marks. And uh, as far as this uh, assignments and uh, your uh, your um, um, J component review is concerned. Uh, we will see that uh, I may have a schedule according to that uh, uh, earlier plan, but uh, any of the students or any uh, members are under um, uh, difficult times uh, due to this COVID, uh, that can be uh, considered and I can uh, certainly uh, 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 reschedule for them and then uh, no, account. that would not uh, uh, make their uh, uh, marks at least uh, for their work is concerned right uh, so that won't be penalized because it's delay it's late submission and so on that i can take care as far as da and your j component assessment is concerned so with that note uh, let's just to proceed with our today's class uh, so what we were doing in the last uh, uh, four uh, three four lectures also we were looking at importantly uh, mechanical system of different orders, first order system, second order system, nth order system, in a generic sense to say. So these uh, mechanical systems can be expressed through a differential equation of that concern orders. <coughs> right. So if you see uh, first order system can be representing an electric circuit or C circuit or it can be used to represent heat uh, uh, transfer thermal uh, 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 problems, thermal um, system problems to account or for that matter, if you look at uh, our vibratory system, any uh, uh, um, uh, system uh, in nature do have uh, an excitation because of that it can have some vibration in it. So the vibratory system can be again modeled to be a second order system. So like that, uh, according to the um, uh, uh, requirement of design and the uh, uh, purpose of the system, you can have the system orders. So if we have such a system to work continuously without any problem uh, safely to provide what is that expected uh, outcome of the system, provided if the system is stable. So that's where we started looking at the stability of the system. And uh, if we have a higher order system like an nth order system, you see that uh, it is very, very cumbersome, even if you have a computational facility to talk on the uh, uh, stability of the system. That is where we had an important assumptions that the systems can be considered to be a linear, time invariant, causal free system and so on. Why? Because uh, we always want to work the systems to in this nature. We do not want any system to go a non-linear state. For that matter, we have uh, learned in longitudinal dynamics the interaction between tire road interaction. You see, we do not want our tire to <clears throat> go into a nonlinear zone beyond peak uh, value of mu p. Of course, it has to work on a nonlinear zone in order to um, uh, acquire a maximum output. But the safe zone is uh, uh, one which is less than um, peak value. Uh, uh, corresponding slip angle, uh, slip, uh, slip longitudinal slip ratio 
or you say uh, in case of lateral dynamic slip angle. So most of the time the system uh, uh, nature, so expectation is to work on as a linear system and it has to work in a steady state. Uh, it has to <clears throat> provide the expected uh, responses uh, and it should be a reliable system or stable system. So for that matter, how do you look at uh, the system design uh, is appropriately done? Is what is through its control strategies. So any control system stability uh, can be uh, looked at by uh, means of uh, uh, applying uh, some criteria. So for example, we learned uh, last week uh, before that uh, Rao stability criterion. Rao stability criterion is the one where you have an entire system. You do not require actually uh, to um, find out the roots of characteristic polynomial for order n. Right. Uh, instead, you are able to talk on the absolute stability of the system just looking at the characteristic equation itself. So that's what we have understood from that criterion. And then we have seen some sample problems and we have learned how do you make an array of uh, Rao's uh, stability criterion. And based on that, how do you talk on uh, looking at number of poles which are on the uh, right half plane without even solving for the roots. So these are all something that we were uh, doing it in the uh, uh, stability point of view and that could be very well applied to uh, uh, systems like uh, um, vibratory system or a system like a bicycle model where you have uh, its two degree freedom system and you had two uh, single degree uh, uh, equations in the state equations as a state equations. So you are able to uh, uh, use the state uh, uh, space representation of the equations and the output equation uh, to get the system uh, uh, transfer functions. So if you have the system transfer function, which would be equivalent to a closed loop transfer function, a simplified uh, closed uh, uh, loop system uh, uh, control design function, then you are able to have uh, uh, the response for any input that can act on the system. So in such things, when you are looking at, we have understood that there are some standard inputs uh, uh, that can be uh, given to the system and we can look at uh, what would be the responses in order to make uh, the uh, various uh, um, uh, systems uh, performance characteristics. So I have different control systems, I have different vehicles. So I need to find out uh, uh, which system is uh, better. So what I will do, I would uh, give some standard inputs instead of uh, uh, relying on the response of the uh, random excitation. Why is it so? Because if I have a response for any system, especially if I have a unit step input function, then it is uh, mathematically viable to get a response of the system for any other input. That is why this uh, uh, unit step input function as an input you give it to the uh, system and then find the response is very popular, right? Why we, we have also seen that from the first order system that there is a relationship between uh, you know, uh, for the response obtained for the direct delta function, unit step input function and unit ramp function, right? So if I have uh, one response, then I can accordingly, for example, if I get a unit uh, step input function response, by simply differentiating the response obtained, I would get what would be the response that is possible for an impulse, uh, uh, unit impulse uh, uh, input. If I integrate it, I would be able to get um, what would be the response corresponding to an input instead of unit step, I give an unit ramp input to the system. So like that, but uh, this uh, um, mathematical determination is, uh, of course, is applicable only to linear time invariant um, uh, uh, causal free system. So this is all something in background that we have learned and we were looking at uh, uh, this. So in this, if you look at any time that we expect uh, that system to act on a steady state uh, uh, condition, of course that steady state condition cannot be reached uh, without having a transient response. So uh, any mathematical uh, uh, governing equation uh, of these systems, so if you look at, you would have two parts, one complementary function part, another one is particular integral part. This particular integral part is what is that is uh, referring to a steady state uh, solution. Complementary part is what is referring to a transient response solution. 
this transient response cannot be eliminated completely as it is depends upon a system uh, parameters like uh, damping present in the system and uh, what is the natural frequency of the system. So uh, uh, you see that uh, this vibratory systems can be uh, classified as undamped system where there is no damping present at all. Where you see that if it is vibrating freely because of initial condition or some initial disturbances, and you see that uh, it will be uh, ever continuing if there is no damping present, right? Another thing, uh, the systems are under damped, critically damped, over damped system we have seen. In this under damped system is what is a uh, vibratory oscillatory system, whereas critically damped or over damped systems cannot have an oscillation, right? So most of the time, uh, the physical system which are operating in a steady state will undergo a uh, transient state and then uh, reaching to its uh, steady state. Uh, for example, if a system is given excited by a unit step input function, the output would uh, reach to its final value corresponding to the given input value of one by passing through a transient response. So this transient response uh, um, needs to be uh, 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 looked at uh, uh, carefully in order to have a design requirement because this transient response may take more time to settle than to reach the steady state or the transient response can quickly disappear and then you will be entering into the steady state. So this quickly settling or uh, taking longer time depends upon an important characteristic of the system called the damping of the system, <clears throat> right? So this all to understand is what we were uh, just looking at uh, um, the response uh, of the uh, second order system for the given unit step function. I am going to continue with that and then have some more clarity on what we were discussing in the last class to complete. Yeah, there's some prompting. Uh, any doubts? Deepak Narayanan. Is he present? Deepak? Yes, I am present, sir. Yeah, you have any doubts? Anything? You, you, you are, uh, no, sir. No, no. Okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, let me just share uh, my uh, smart board and then we'll continue today's class. So hope you are able to see this screen. And uh, uh, let me just look at what we were doing in the last class. So we were just doing this uh, in the last class uh, before your CAT exam. And you see here the second order system uh, uh, governing equation is this. Of course, this is for uh, the equation written. There was some uh, uh, clarity uh, that I had to give, which were in the last class we stuck. We'll just see that. So this is our governing equation where this is our input. <clears throat> so what is that uh, uh, normally uh, uh, any design of control system uh, to look at uh, uh, its characteristic performance? What we normally do is we will do it for an initial state. Initial condition of the system is zero, corresponding to output zero and the initial condition zero. That is what we will always do, do it to find out its natural characteristics. That's what is called a free vibration analysis. And then we will be able to give your input and then we will work on. So uh, when I had uh, this discussion here, you see this one by K factor is what I was telling. So that is not uh, be present here because I have to look at my second order system study for this transient or steady state response. Uh, I should initially consider all the initial conditions zero. What do I mean by that? The physical system is at rest. The output is zero and any uh, um, time varying uh, output uh, derivatives are zeros. That is the meaning of uh, an in initial state rest condition. So when I have that, there is no output on the uh, other side. So this is going to be zero for my uh, equation. So what is my governing equation? It is mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals zero. So in this equation, if I divide by k, I would end up with this transfer function. So this transfer function denominator polynomial roots are my characteristic roots um, for the initial state zero, right? So that is what I should uh, understand. 
and then we do not have a question of this one by k comes on the other side. So if I have my transfer function like this, then it comes that now I give an input as direct delta function or an unit step function, what would happen? Then I had to go ahead with doing it. So uh, writing this uh, uh, general equation of uh, second order differential equation, having an input on the right hand side, uh, instead I should have that is then equal to zero and then I should have my transfer function determined and that time I will not have this one by k here, right? Please uh, follow that. And then I would uh, start discussing that uh, if this should be g of s is equal to omega n squared by s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared is my transfer function. Then if I give a direct delta function, its Laplace transform is 1. So I would just to get my uh, uh, response of the system by taking Laplace inverse transform of g of s. So that is the uh, response that I would get, right? So if I get that, I would see this is it, uh, what we were discussing. Uh, this is our transfer function and uh, the parameters of the system is zeta and omega n. And uh, there are two roots of the characteristic polynomial. Both roots lie on the left half plane, that stable system. And we were able to have four cases, uh, different cases based on this parameter. <clears throat> so under damped system, critically damped system, over damped system, when zeta is zero, it's called an undamped system. Right, so then the roots are uh, how that is varying. So in this, you have to see that the first case under damped system, uh, you see that you have two roots which are having negative real part with the complex uh, number. Right, so this system is uh, going to be stable system. Their poles will be on the left half plane as the real part is negative real part. Look at now for a critically damped system, you have your uh, repeated roots, the negative roots, real roots. So there won't be any problem of stability in the system. Look at over damped system, you still have your negative uh, uh, real part, right? Uh, negative real part. So that's not an issue. When uh, you see zeta equals zero, undamped system, you see uh, you do not have negative part, rather it is uh, complex conjugate roots uh, um, plus or minus. So that is why it is an oscillatory system and there is no zeta in this. So the system is ever vibrating system unless and until you have a damping present in the system. So this is your undamped system. So this two first case and the fourth case only are the oscillatory system, whereas uh, uh, the other two are not an oscillatory system. Uh, uh, what do you mean by that? If I give for this system unit step uh, input function, the overshoot of my uh, response is not going to be present for uh, the critically damped system as well as over damped system. So what do you mean by overshoot? That's what also we have looked at in the previous class. Just before that, let's look at what is our standard input unit step function. So you know how to define that unit step function is what is uh, explained here. So u of t value is one for all values of t greater than or equal to zero. u of t is zero for all values of t less than zero. So you graphically represent your input function as this, right? And it's Laplace uh, transform of unit step function is one by s. So uh, it is easy to get your response in uh, uh, Laplace domain simply by product of your transfer function, closed loop transfer function multiplied by the um, um, Laplace transform of your uh, input function, step input function. And uh, we have used a partial fraction technique and then we are able to uh, factorize them and the Laplace inverse uh, on those uh, factored uh, polynomial if you take, well, uh, what you get is uh, your time response. So most of the control system work on a time response basis, right? So you require to look at this uh, time response so critically. So this x of t equal one minus e raised to minus zeta omega and p cos omega d t t minus zeta by under root of one minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega and t sine omega d t is what is an important equation. You can also write uh, in another uh, way this equation. Uh, we'll see that. Uh, in today's class. And how do you get this? Uh, for that, you should have these two formulas to help you. 
I have also given you a reference textbook. Uh, if you go through that, uh, you would see that in the appendix we have a necessary Laplace transform and inverse Laplace transform formulas. Right, and uh, you see that what would be the error? So input uh, minus output is what is this? So e of t is what is my error function uh, for uh, t uh, greater than or equal to zero values. At steady state, t tends to infinity. Error is zero. That means uh, you expect that uh, the response is going to be of unit value. So you would uh, be able to have this. So this is what is your response. So you can see here uh, uh, this when zeta value is between 0 and 1, greater than 0, less than 1, you see the system is oscillatory system. right? You have uh, here a peak that is what is called an overshoot. Why it's called overshoot? It goes beyond the value of your input, right? And then it is settling down uh, because of it is reduces that peak because of the damping present in the system. You see, in the case of zeta zero, there is no um, uh, um, variation you have. Your uh, um, response ever goes. Uh, there is no um, change in that response. Right, and uh, you will see that uh, uh, there is no transient response. You can, uh, it is with an error. It is not transient response. Uh, it is with an error. So if zeta is zero and you give a unit step input function, you would have an average value of one, but you cannot have uh, your uh, response reaches to unit value, even at time infinity, uh, because there is no damping present. So you would see that uh, there is something called a time constant, which is going to be function of uh, zeta and omega n inversely proportional to their values. So uh, as zeta value zero here, you would never have uh, the value uh, of an undamped, um, undamped system to reach to uh, one value, which is your step input, unit step input. Whereas uh, damped system, uh, there is uh, uh, time. So with that time, you would see that. So if I take this, this of 0.2 percent of its final value, and I'll get this time corresponding to its what is called uh, uh, settling time, settling time, right? So we have defined some parameters of this transient responses as delay time, rise time, peak time, settling time, maximum overshoot, and so on. So these are all something that I'm going to still look at it into uh, this uh, discussion of today's class right so we just are looking at this so you see here when zeta is one critically damped system when zeta is greater than one it is so when, what do you mean by over damped system the system is sluggish system so it takes longer time to reach its uh, uh, response so it, it will have uh, some uh, uh, error otherwise if you have a specific time and you see there will be always an error uh, and that error would become uh, zero or will reach to 2 to 5 percent value and that takes very long time in over damp system and there is no peak for over damp system similarly there is no peak for a critically damp system so it's only for an undamped and uh, under damp system so any system design should have some value of damping so that uh, according to the need uh, the settling time can be adjusted so um, any control system design, you would have your transient response. And uh, looking at the transient response, you would play with the parameter zeta and omega n so that uh, you would decide according to the need how quickly the system should settle to the response expected or can you do some uh, tolerance of uh, vibration and so on. So for this, you should understand these parameters definitions clearly. <clears throat> See, that's what we were doing it in the last class, uh, seeing that uh, uh, definition of delay time. So how do you define delay time? Delay time is the time required for a response to reach half the value of its final value. Final value is 1, so 0.5. So whatever the time from 0 starting till to reach the half the value first is what is uh, delay time. What is rise time? First time to reach to the final value but it is uh, going beyond that to uh, have some peak, then it comes back. So at first time when it reaches its final value <coughs> of an under damp system, uh, you define what is called uh, rise time. What is peak time? 
it is a time required to realize the first peak in your uh, response for the unit step function is what is peak time what is uh, uh, maximum percent overshoot if the system has got some steady state error it doesn't reach to its final value one then you should have uh, the definition of uh, maximum overshoot is given by what is the response at the peak time that is what is the uh, peak value here uh, minus uh, what would be the response as t tends to infinity at t tends to infinity that difference is what is maximum overshoot to get it in percent divide by uh, x of t and multiply by 100 <coughs> so you get your uh, maximum percent overshoot and settling time settling time is the time uh, required to uh, reach your uh, final value maybe 100 percent uh, uh, of its original uh, final uh, input value one or it, it would take longer time so it is uh, expected that uh, design of control system even if it reaches uh, to two percent to five percent according to the design requirement you would say that the time uh, settling time so this settling time can be uh, changed according to the um, changes that you can make on the parameter for that let us just calculate this rise time peak time maximum overshoot and settling time for a second order system and that is what is that plan for today's class uh, that we will do so this is some discussion of doubts that was arised on the last class on uh, coefficient of static friction and uh, rolling friction and there was also a doubt arised uh, uh, for the racing cars how do you define the braking efficiency so for a racing car or any vehicle for that matter the braking efficiency is limited by road erosion coefficient and the load on the vehicle that cannot change <clears throat> and the efficiency in our passenger car as we defined what is the deceleration rate that was associated with your vehicle to that of the road erosion coefficient for the given road surface and uh, you have to remember that we have defined and then we had uh, analytical equation you would have also answered during your examination right uh, um, that uh, with a lot of assumptions so we do not consider any aerodynamic force we do not consider uh, we have only considered the drag is uh, uh, and the resistance is uh, only through uh, inertial force right so that was one of the reason another important reason uh, that that has to be considered and uh, in racing car the uh, question is during uh, peak cornering you know uh, i have been also uh, sent by some documents that uh, the rider uh, of the race car is subjected to uh, the acceleration level uh, of uh, 4.5 g higher value than g so how do you define braking efficiency there is what was the question arise so braking efficiency is concerned whatever the load of your racing car and mu p of the surface that is going to limit it that's on one side but you may ask the question that the person seated rider is subjected to higher deceleration value greater than g value right so we have seen that uh, 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 in our passenger car study uh, the value of acceleration uh, at the cg location is not that much but in racing car it is happening is uh, because of the parameter of the vehicle the mass uh, and the uh, rotation inertia of the vehicle of the uh, race car is different and uh, most importantly your vehicle is subjected to not only the uh, weight of the vehicle also there is an aerodynamic uh, push ground force acting down uh, that is how the race cars have been designed so to have more hold on, uh, on the ground so when you have that you would have more load and uh, what is the g force of a person uh, experiencing is what is proportional to the weight of the person right so uh, it, it is not uh, g force why it is because the weight total weight of your race car and the aerodynamic uh, um, uh, ground force it is not a lift force your vehicle is designed so that it is not aerodynamic lift rather it is aerodynamic downward force so that force uh, if you look at the weight of that and along with it uh, you see that the force experienced by uh, the racer 
would be 4 Gs or 5 Gs when it is said, the weight of the person into 9.81. So that is what is uh, said. So you can't relate that values to your braking. You cannot relate that value to your braking. Braking system has got its limitation from the uh, road surface, right? So with that, uh, let me just uh, uh, stop uh, this kind of discussion and then get into our today's detail of the lecture. Maybe another 20 minutes, I'll stop today's class. So this is lecture number 35 and today's date 2604-2021. I'm going to continue with this second order system. Looking at second order system response to unit step input. A response to unit step input, right? So what was that we derived in the last class uh, is uh, output response y of t is given by 1 minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t cos omega d t minus zeta 1 minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega n t sin omega d t. So this is the response. Right. This response uh, can also be seen now in this. If you look at, I have this e raised to zeta omega n t is common in both. If I take that out, I can have this y of t as 1 minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t. And this is going to be cos omega d t. And this is going to be minus. Minus is taken out. So this is going to be plus zeta by 1 minus zeta square into sine omega d t. So this is the response of second order system for unit step input. <clears throat> when I have zeta here, I consider the zeta value uh, typically greater than 0.4 and less than 0.8. So that you would say that uh, if any value of zeta less than 0.4 is so uh, lightly damped system, greater than 0.8 is over damped, uh, not over damped, is, uh, uh, largely damped system, largely damped system, we can say, right? So over damped system means zeta greater than one, largely damped system. So typical uh, value of zeta would vary from 0.4 to 0.8 in most of the physical systems. Uh, now, uh, let us define these uh, uh, transient response specifications. Uh, what all that we had, rise time, peak time, settling time, maximum overshoot, uh, by having these responses. Right? So let's first do it for rise time. Rise time. That's T R. So what is that rise time uh, response? When, uh, when uh, rise time response to understand, this is my response. This is T, this is 0, this is 1 unit step expected output. My response goes something like this. And uh, rise time is the 1. When it is first time, the response goes to its final value. But it is goes beyond that. So this is TR. So this is what you refer. So when my response curve, this is what is my Y of T what is there here when uh, uh, rise time to find out uh, this y of t value is what is one so if i put that here in this equation one i would have one equals one minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t into cos omega d t plus zeta by one minus zeta square sine omega d t so this one one goes off so what would be, uh, what is that I would have? 
So I can say that when one one goes off this side as zero, so uh, you you know that uh, cos omega dt plus this whatever is there uh, can be made equal to zero because this term cannot be made equal to zero. So if this is going to be zero equals minus e raised to zeta omega n t into cos omega d t plus zeta by one minus zeta square sine omega d t. Um, for satisfying this equation, I cannot uh, make uh, e raised to zeta omega n t zero. So you would say that e raised to minus zeta omega n t is not equal to zero. Hence, cos cos omega dt plus zeta by 1 minus zeta square sine omega dt equals 0. I can make this equal 0. So from this I would be able to get now what is my? The moment I substitute this here 1, this time become rise time. This become rise time. So this is a rise time omega dt. Right? So I can uh, now uh, rewrite uh, from this I can find what is my rise time that's simple take one term on the other side uh, so it is going to be tan omega d t because I take this on this side the sine omega d t uh, and uh, divide this and I would have this uh, on the other side 1 minus zeta squared by zeta so this would be there so I, I require now what this is tr rise time I require rise time. So how do I get that? I can take now uh, uh, what is my omega dt r? It is tan inverse of minus of uh, 1 minus zeta squared by zeta. And uh, rise time therefore tr is 1 by omega d tan inverse of minus of 1 minus zeta square by zeta. That's my rise time. So I can uh, uh, um, see that uh, already that we have looked at the roots of this characteristic uh, equation S1 comma S2 would be minus zeta omega n plus or minus j into omega d. This is what we had uh, the roots by solving the characteristic polynomial, right? So uh, you see that in this, uh, it is similar to minus sigma plus or minus j omega d I am writing. So what is that by comparing this? I can uh, uh, write this sigma is what is zeta omega n. Sigma is what is zeta omega n. <coughs> Real part of my root. And uh, uh, omega n, you know what is omega d definition? Omega n into 1 minus zeta squared is what is omega d. So by using this uh, is what uh, I can uh, replace this in this um, by this way. So my tr is going to be 1 by omega d tan inverse of uh, this term is going to be changed as omega d by sigma minus sigma. So this you need to understand how does it come. So uh, what is omega d from this? Uh, omega d, uh, this is omega n, right? Omega d equals this, this is omega n, this is omega n. So if I uh, have to get 1 minus zeta squared, that's omega d by omega n. And uh, um, sigma is zeta omega n. So if I substitute that uh, here, I would have this back, right? So this, so if I have this representation uh, of this time, uh, to see this uh, no, more clearly, let me take my complex plane. Uh, in the complex plane, this is uh, j omega axis, and this is plus sigma. So you have uh, the definition of tan inverse of omega d by sigma can be represented in this way. So I have my pole placed here, and you see that it forms a triangle. Now, what is this uh, angle? Let me call this angle as beta. So this tan beta is what is opposite by 
adjacent. So this value should be minus sigma. This value should be omega d. So now you see that this angle here, tan inverse of beta. So tan inverse of, uh, sorry, uh, not beta. Uh, yeah, tan beta is what is this? Tan uh, beta is what is equal to uh, omega d by minus sigma. Or I can rewrite this as 1 by omega d tan inverse uh, 1 by omega d into uh, this minus sign to take I can write write it as pi minus beta pi minus beta this is my tr this is my tr right sign what is this angle this angle outer angle is pi minus beta so to eliminate this minus sign i just to take this right so tan inverse of omega d by minus sigma is simply pi minus beta by omega d pi minus beta by omega d so what does that you understand from this for a small value of tr what do you mean by tr is very small the rise time should be very small that means the first time achieving the uh, value of one should be so quick that means the slope of this uh, rise of your response should be greater then tpu tr would be uh, rise time would be very small so when you have rise time is very small what does that it happens uh, you look at in this uh, if that is to be very small uh, here here you have this omega d in denominator should be large so far tr to be small omega d to be large omega d to be larger large value now what is omega d it is uh, damped natural or uh, damped uh, frequency of the system damped natural frequency of the system so if damping is present and then uh, you are uh, having only transient response you are disturbing the system only then uh, whatever the uh, oscillation that you have frequency of oscillation is what is omega d so that omega d is what is expressed in terms of uh, omega n and zeta value um, by this e equation that we know from the uh, fundamentals of equation <coughs> so now uh, uh, rise time to be smaller that means what uh, uh, it would aid in um, uh, having uh, your response peak uh, comes uh, peak time to be also reduced and then peak time is reduced then settling time uh, uh, can also be reduced but if you look at uh, uh, there can be another problem that uh, you may have peak value suits up more you should not have more peak value also because more peak value is what is your response amplitude uh, and transient state so if uh, your uh, system design has to pass through the transient response if peak is too much um, uh, then uh, it, it is not preferred in the system so you require uh, less peak at the same time you require um, uh, less settling time then it is a compromise so that's what we have to understand so for that let us define now what is peak time right so next let us define what is peak time for the system TP. So how do I define peak time? So peak time is defined like this. So this is my first uh, peak and then it falls down and goes like this. Uh, the time corresponding to the first peak or uh, first peak corresponding to over so first to overshoot. This is first to overshoot. Then again uh, shoots up. Then it goes like that. It dies out. So this is what is peak time. So how do you get this peak time? You see there is the maximum value of your response. So how do you get the maximum value of the response? By differentiating the response. So you have uh, your time response for unit step input. Y of t as 1 minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t uh, cos omega d t minus zeta by 1 minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega n t 
sin omega d t. So peak time to get, I should differentiate this with respect to time. This function, if I differentiate and equating that to zero, uh, then I would be able to have uh, the time corresponding to the peak value. So uh, now let us differentiate this. So if I differentiate this, uh, uh, what is that I would have? What is my d y by d t? d y. Uh, here d y t p. If I put this, that will be equal to zero. Uh, and d y by d t would be now. So uh, differentiate this function. So this is constant one zero. So here I have a product. So if I have a product, uh, then uh, my differentiation goes like that. First, let me take uv, right? So it is minus of minus plus zeta omega n e raised to minus zeta omega n t cos omega dt plus. I have to keep this and then differentiate this. So um, how is it going to be? Uh, I have to keep this. So that is minus e raised to zeta omega n t and cos omega d t is minus sin um, minus omega d sin omega d t. So minus and minus become plus. So this is going to be e raised to minus zeta omega n t sin uh, into omega d sin omega d t. This is what is uh, first term. And uh, uh, in the similar way, I can get my second term that is minus zeta by one minus zeta square. Right? Uh, this is constant that I take out. So this is like a similar way I have to do. So if I do that, it is minus zeta omega n uh, uh, e raised to minus zeta omega n t sine omega d t plus e raised to minus zeta omega n t omega d cos omega d t. So this is my derivation, the differentiation of this function, uh, the response. So if this is made equal to zero, I would have my, uh, uh, what is that, peak time value expression. And then we will know what it depends on. So you look at this term, and this term goes off. This term and this term goes off, right? Because you see here I have this. Of course, if I uh, take this inside, I will have this term uh, um, multiplied with this fraction. Let me just, uh, how does it go to understand? Let me just uh, put this once again, this step I will put so you'll understand. Uh, zeta omega n e raised to minus zeta omega n t cos omega d t. That's this first term. And then this term, uh, I, I'm going to have, see here, this is omega d. So this omega d can be replaced by omega n into 1 minus zeta squared under root, right? So if I substitute that, uh, what would happen here is, this is going to be zeta, same term, zeta omega n, e raised to minus zeta omega n t, cos omega d t. That's going to be uh, like this. Because when I multiply this zeta by 1 minus zeta squared here, uh, I would have what? Uh, This omega d, uh, this omega d is what is omega n into 1 minus zeta square. So when I take this inside, this term is going off. Uh, so of course, this is outside, I have this square root. So that term goes off, and uh, I would have these two terms identical. So that again disappears. That is why these two are cancelled. So this two goes off. And I have uh, the remaining term, two terms, 
e raised to minus zeta omega n t omega d sin omega d t plus zeta square because the zeta and there is a zeta here so this becomes zeta square minus into minus plus so zeta squared by 1 minus zeta square within radical omega n because of uh, the substitution uh, omega n into e raised to minus zeta omega n t sin omega d t. So again, this can be simplified. I can take a common term out. These two terms are, of course, goes off. And in this, I would take uh, e raised to minus zeta omega n t out. So this is going to be e raised to minus zeta omega n t into uh, what is there here is uh, uh, sin omega dt. Here also sin omega dt is there. That if I take out sin omega dt, if I take out again in this uh, inside, I would have uh, uh, here what is that I would have omega d I will have here what is that I have uh, zeta square omega n. So omega n zeta squared by 1 minus zeta square I would have. That's all equal to 0. So in this, whatever is there in this parenthesis, whatever is there in this parenthesis. So this is one term. This is, on, uh, this is also a term taken out, common term taken out. So don't put this bracket. So I cannot have this is uh, uh, to satisfy this equation to be zero, I cannot have uh, omega d plus of this term is uh, equal to zero. I cannot make and uh, exponential term also cannot be zero. Only what can be made zero to satisfy this equation is uh, sine omega d t can be equal to zero, right? The other two terms cannot be equal to zero. So when uh, sine of angle is zero, when it is zero angle pi, two pi, uh, and it's multiple. So if omega d by t value is equal to n pi for n value equals zero, one, two, and so on, I would have this is satisfied. So what is my, uh, this is what tp now. When I make it to zero, it's tp. So tp peak time is n pi by omega d. And uh, here that we know uh, peak time we define for the first peak. So for a first peak, n value is equal to 1. So that should be equal to pi by omega d. Pi by omega subscript d is what is tp. Right? So. So here peak time corresponds to what is the first peak uh, uh, overshoot. That's why I have to take uh, n as 1 and I would have my peak time is simply by pi by omega d of the system. Right. So you know in this omega d of course is equal to omega n 1 minus zeta square. Right. So the peak time depends upon your natural frequency as well as this the damping value. That's what is given by omega d here. So it depends upon, because we have most of the time the system is the under damped system between 0.4 to 0.8 if you consider, your peak time depends upon pi by omega d. So omega, it is inversely proportional to omega d. That's the peak time. So you can also witness in this, since it is pi by omega d, it is half cycle half cycle of frequency of damped oscillation, right? So this peak time is corresponding to, so TP corresponds to, to half cycle of the frequency of damped oscillation. Of damped oscillation and that can be witnessed here see look at in this uh, graph uh, it starts from here it goes to peak and it comes back here and again it comes to this value is what is one cycle 
So the TP would be half the cycle. So here it is pi by omega d. So this value would be 2 pi by omega d. And from here again, it goes and comes back here. It's a second cycle and so on it goes. So like that, how many number of cycles are there? You can see. So you can also define as peak time as half the uh, cycle corresponding to frequency of damped oscillation, right? So that's what uh, you understand from this uh, peak time determination. Now let's look at what is maximum overshoot. So maximum overshoot. Maximum overshoot. MP. How does it mean defined? That is defined for any system which is going to have some steady state error. It, it will not reach to a final value of unit value. Then I would define that uh, MP as it is response at peak time, whatever that we have found now, minus response at time tends to infinity by response at time tends to infinity. <laughs> if response at time tends to infinity is 1, my maximum overshoot. So in percentage to say it has to be multiplied by 100. So this should be. This is 1, so it is simply y of tp minus 1 into 100. Right? So now it is simple. So y of tp is what that we have now. How do you get y of tp? I know what is my tp, that is pi by omega d. So I can substitute that in this pi by omega d and then I can get my response. Right? So I have my y of t here. And t should be pi by omega d if I substitute, I would have my uh, response. And that would be uh, like this. So let me just put that now here. So what is my y of t? y of tp? y of tp is 1 minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t cos omega d t minus zeta by 1 minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega n t sine omega d t. That's my y of t. That's my y of t my response. So y of t p means uh, um, t should be replaced by phi by omega d pi by omega d if I put here, omega d omega d goes off. What is cos pi minus 1? So this become 1 plus this value. And here sine pi is 0, so this term goes off. So I would have y of tp, which is equal to y of t value is pi by omega d. That's going to be 1 plus e raised to minus zeta. t is pi by omega d. So what is this is going to be? Here is to zeta omega n. I put uh, instead of substituting, I put that as tp here for convenient tp and rest all zero. So, this is what is my uh, response at tp. So, this is pi by omega d. If I put it is zeta pi omega n by omega d, right? Uh, now, my uh, uh, mp is what y of tp minus 1. Correct or oh, minus one if there is no steady state error at the reaches um, uh, at least two percent of the final value, right? Then it is going to be or it reaches the final value one. At reaches final value one, then uh, what is that? It's going to be uh, uh, this minus one. So this goes off. One goes off. One minus e raised to minus zeta omega n tp minus one. So this goes off. I have that as uh, yeah. You have other class, you can proceed, uh, and then I just complete in five minutes. I can uh, listen back later. <clears throat> uh, so if I substitute this here. Um, 
I would have. So this one one goes. There is a minus sign here. No, no. So this plus. So this plus. So this one one goes. I have here e raised to minus zeta omega n tp. So let's substitute now tp here. E raised to minus zeta omega n. Tp is uh, pi by omega d. Pi by omega d. So omega d is omega n into one minus zeta square. So it's going to be e raised to minus zeta by root of one minus zeta square into pi. <clears throat> we have also seen that uh, um, one minus zeta square by zeta, right? As omega d by uh, what was that we are doing? Uh, we, we, we have seen this current minus zeta is minus omega d by sigma that we have seen. So we can replace this again by uh, this. Uh, that's going to be e raised to minus sigma by omega d into pi. And since it is to be in percentage, I should multiply this with 100. That much the percentage. That's my maximum overshoot. So maximum overshoot values given by uh, this expression. Where sigma is what? A sigma is zeta omega n. Omega d is omega n into 1 minus zeta square. You know that, right? So you would have this. Now the last uh, one is what is settling time? Uh, I just take two minutes to complete this two three minutes. So fourth parameter is settling time. T yes, very important. Uh, you see the response y of t what we had in the previous case can also be written in this way for an under dam system, right? So what was the response that we had? It is 1 minus e minus it is to zeta omega i and t cos omega d t minus zeta by 1 minus zeta square and radical minus zeta omega i and t sin omega d t. So this is the response can also be rewritten as this for an under dam system 1 minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t by 1 minus zeta square only with the sine angle sine of omega d t plus tan inverse of 1 minus zeta square by zeta like this also you can write for t value greater than or equal to zero this is also uh, response. Uh, you can also represent uh, this instead of two function cos and sine. If I combine and I can write this as phi omega d t plus uh, phi, this is phase angle. So I can also represent like this in your vibration textbook. You can see this uh, yeah. also the solution for this. So if I have this, then my settling time can be defined as this way. It can have uh, plus or minus 2%. If plus or minus two percent, fine, or it can be plus or minus five percent of its what of its final value of its final value. So this would be two percent of the final value. Final value is unity of the final value. So what is that value for plus or minus 2% to be there? It is four times time constant. So what is time constant here is one by zeta omega n. One by zeta omega n, four by zeta omega n, which is four by 40, four times capital T, right? Or it can be three by zeta omega n, which should be equal to 3t. So if I go for 3t, I would have 5% of its final value reached plus or minus. If I go for 4t, I would have 2% of my final value 
reached according to the requirement of design of your control system uh, transient response. If my transient response uh, accordingly, I will design my uh, settling time. So you see that it is uh, uh, can be understood clearly if I plot uh, this response, uh, this response uh, in the graph. Uh, as this is one settling time. I have uh, my time axis here this is zero. So this is T, 2T, 3T, 4T that we are talking on. So what is this uh, T? T is one by zeta omega n. One by zeta omega n is what is uh, T. So the response here, whatever that we had, that is that's going to be uh, corresponding to this. It, it, it goes like this. The decay of this, if you look at the envelope of this decay, this envelope is given by this one. This one plus there is a value, this addition, that's one plus e raised to minus zeta omega n t by and the root of one minus zeta square. And this side, it is one minus of the same, one minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t by the root of one minus zeta square. So there is a pair of envelope of this response that's given by this. <coughs> that's given by this. All right. Uh, <coughs> having this value, how much it is now? Uh, when t is equal to zero, if I substitute this, is going to be one. So this is going to be one plus one by the root of one minus zeta squared. What is this value here? Corresponding value. When uh, when t is zero, I would have here uh, this response one minus of this value. So um, this value is one minus one by root of one minus zeta square. If zeta is zero, what would happen? It is zero. If zeta is some fraction value, what would happen? Look at uh, if zeta is 0.4, there's some value here. So one by that is greater than one. So you would have some value here. So this curve would be here on the negative right here, right? Yeah. So this envelope, a pair of envelope is present there, where this T is what is called time constant. This uh, of this envelope. Uh, right, and that is given by one by zeta omega n. So you can see here uh, this time t is smaller. This value is quicker the settling time. Right, the smaller the value is preferred. If it is to be smaller, you see here uh, it is uh, inversely proportional to zeta and omega n. So zeta uh, should be greater. If zeta is greater. Uh, then uh, uh, zeta is greater, uh, greater. That means uh, damping more uh, in the system. Uh, more the damping, more quickly it will be settling. That's what uh, uh, that you are understanding, right? So uh, let me just give this note. So what does that notice for a given omega n? This t yes is function of damping ratio only. If I have my system and omega n is this natural frequency of the system for a given omega n, it is inversely proportional to zeta. So uh, that the settling time is inversely proportional to the uh, uh, value zeta, or you can say it's inversely proportional to the product zeta and omega n of the system. Since the value of zeta is usually determined from the requirement of permissible maximum overshoot. Permissible maximum overshoot. See, if I have very less value of zeta, I would have uh, this t uh, increases. Uh, this overshoot may be <coughs> more. So the zeta value decided from permissible value of uh, maximum overshoot. The settling time is uh, determined primarily by undamped natural frequency. This means that. The duration of the transient period may be varied without changing the maximum overshoot by adjusting 
the undamped natural frequency. <coughs> because the zeta value is damping, that decides what is this maximum peak or overshoot. I have decided my overshoot should be limited by some value. If I fix that, uh, then I can vary this uh, time only by varying this omega m natural frequency. So if I mm, go with my maximum value of, uh, uh, means increasing the natural frequency of the system, I would have this T less without uh, having compromise uh, or change in this maximum overshoot. That's what is explained here. So this all basically depends upon your physical uh, control system design requirement uh, that you work on. So this is what is uh, uh, transient response uh, of your second order system, uh, which can also be a uh, uh, similar way looked at uh, for your vehicle dynamic study in handling. So your bicycle model has been given uh, with your input as an unit step input. So what do you mean by unit step input is unit, uh, you, you drive your uh, vehicle on a skid path and you give uh, uh, sudden uh, steering angle and hold that steering angle. That's what is the step uh, input steering angle. So if you give such a, a, a sudden disturbance on the uh, response of your vehicle by giving a, a change in steering angle. So you are driving straight, so steering is zero. So at T is equal to zero or greater than zero, you are going to have the same steering angle. So give some steering angle and hold it. And that's the equivalent to giving uh, step function to the uh, uh, vehicle and you would have your response uh, accordingly uh, for the given steering uh, uh, input uh, value which remains constant uh, as t greater than or equal to zero what would be the response so the response what is that you are expecting is you are expecting the response uh, um, of uh, um, uh, lateral velocity and uh, yaw velocity in your bicycle model. So how do you get them? Uh, you can get those responses, uh, uh, output responses uh, by uh, looking at the state uh, equation and output equation. So from state and output equation representation, I can find out what is called the SI minus A. So SI minus A is what is uh, uh, denominator polynomial and making that is equal to zero characteristic roots. So we have used that for uh, uh, stability analysis. To find out the transient response, what I should do is it is Laplace transform of inverse Laplace transform of SI minus A inverse function. So that's something called a resolvent matrix property that if you understand, you would be able to get uh, you know, from the um, state space representation of bicycle model these responses in the similar line what we have discussed so far. So I stop at this point of time. And if you have any doubts, uh, let us look at it. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we will go ahead with it uh, uh, further in the next class on Wednesday. Any doubts? If there are no doubts, I just have downloaded uh, your attendance. I'll stop recording.